All right, listen up, spuds. This is Zap Brannigan, eh? master of time, space, and everything else in between. And, uh, oh, yeah, winner of this year's Modesty Award. Yeah. You're listening to You Suck. What's the difference with Al and Tom? You're one stop for this sort of thing. Yeah. Hello there, guys, and welcome to You Suck's What's the Difference podcast. I'm Alex Whiteley. Wow. I'm Tom <laughs> Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining the show, guys. Um, and uh, we have a, a very special guest. F- uh, thanks to the guys from TV Guestbert. We've been doing this for a long time now. It's been over a year where um, TV Guestbert su- suggests guests for us to come and bring on the show. And we're very delighted to bring Dr. Sheila Foreman. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sheila Foreman. Thank you so much for having me. And I also have to do a shout out to TV Guestbirds. I've been with them for a while and they're fantastic. So I wouldn't be meeting you if it weren't for them. So I appreciate it. That's been but, our experience with a lot of guests, mm-hmm. and they're just they're just because normally we kind of go after a certain guest, and they've they've really raised our bar and like our like uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well what we think we can actually do for guests. Because if you would have asked us a couple of years ago, like, do you guys think that you could interview doctors and be like, no, no, they're 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 up here and we're down here, and I don't know about <laughs> that. And now that we've done it like five or six times, it really just kind of like we we could talk to anyone because that's what we enjoy doing. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, we just tend to enjoy the. Conversation conversation it, it also it also helps with the because i speak to all sorts of people anyway i mean today i've been at a food festival in shrewsbury and i spoke to um the guys from harper adams university here in in, in, in shropshire and we were talking about the um the, f- the fusion of technology and agriculture so that's using like um sensor drones and, and robots and and things with farming and it's very very interesting i was like and this guy who's a lecturer he's a professor at, at, at harper adams i'm like i'm gonna have to speak to this guy about like ai stuff and, <laughs> and, and, you know <laughs> but with the guys that we speak to get tv guests but i feel like it's very it's, it's it helps us use the language uh, that we can um sort of use to get these difficult conversations at times across uh, yes. sometimes it's about starting the conversation, isn't it? You know, it certainly is. Thank you for yeah. having me to have this conversation. I'm so no, excited good. to be with you guys this morning. For well, me, it's, it's morning, and yeah, I'm in it, California, and it's morning. <laughs> um, right now, it's it's mid afternoon. It's it's evening for Alex. I find to be very mm-hmm. fortuitous though, because um, one of the things I I did um, keto, as as any of the listeners know, um, I I was 280 pounds like uh, two years ago. And I, I've been very big for a very long time. I did keto. Um, I'm down to 180 to any given days, lost, you know, all that weight. But I find that the hardest thing about like the what I what I do right now is I intermediate fast for like 18 hours a day in between like meals. And I tend to try to eat sensibly. I try to make sure I eat a very well balanced. I love cooking. So I'm, you know, I'm not like I'm like, oh, poo poo to vegetables. I like everything. I try to eat. But what I find my biggest problem is that like trying I, I'm always chasing the sense of fulfillment like this mm-hmm. full feeling that i was very used yeah. to being a bigger guy like you know you eat until you're full and that's what you learn as a child right you're like oh when i'm full i'm full but that's not necessarily true you know because as you get older your stomach gets you know bigger and more food is taken to reach the capacity of the point that you actually feel full so now i'm always chasing that in which case i find to be my biggest struggle because i'm trying to maintain this form that i'm very very proud of but it's it's always the the never ending struggle of oh but you could probably have like is it okay to have a little bit of this and that kind of falls in line with what you do I, I we were looking mm-hmm. at your book um, can you please tell everyone um, what what you do Dr Sheila of course thank you so I am a clinical psychologist and I have been working with people who have weight and eating issues for over twenty years but more recently I have become a mindful eating coach I studied mindfulness based eating awareness and I've incorporated the principles and techniques of mindfulness into my work with eating and weight and it's created incredible results for the people that I work with and one of the things that you learn Tom is mindful fullness when is your body full as opposed to your mind Because so much of us have been trained to feel full when we've overeaten. And overeating, I mean more than what our body actually requires to keep us going. But we're used to that. And anything less than that feels like we're still hungry or we need more. 
But when you do mindfulness and you become attuned to that, it's actually easy to stop. But it's a skill you have to learn, and that's part of what I help people do. Well, I mean, we're, we're all creatures of uh, feast and famine, right? Like uh, yes. our, our great ancestors, you know, they didn't have the accessibility to refrigeration. They're going to be able to go to a store yeah. and be able to pick up meat and all that type of stuff. It's it's either um, foraging and hunting and gathering and all that. And that's how they basically, um, you know, survive for thousands of years. So like when they had a big meal, they'd have a big meal. It's one of the reasons that our bodies can extend the way that they do is because we're mm -hmm. used to being able to take in as much as we can when we can, but because we have such ease and access to all the food in the world we could possibly want people tend to overdo it myself included do you find that's everybody or is it just like a certain type of mindset of people what kind of dictates this behavior you know this these days i haven't talked to everybody so i can't tell you it's everybody you haven't? i okay, have well once you come the back to the census of the world please come back on the show and then we'll have the new you. conversation excellent, but, excellent but the people that i do talk to especially during the pandemic i have to say these extraordinary times Food became a coping mechanism. People would eat and eat and eat. And what you said about our ancestors is true. Because it was feast or famine, because our ancestors didn't know that they could go to the corner market and bring back a slab of meat, they would have to eat it when it came to them. They would eat it. Our bodies are designed to take in that food and store it because it expects later on we're going to have that famine. We don't have famine anymore. We, but we have an abundance of food. You can find food everywhere. I remember one time being in a pet store and finding candy for human beings at the register. And I thought, okay, we've really lost it. Um, <laughs> because yeah, the food and, is uh, everywhere. And I was going to add to that is like in the, in the UK, I don't know if you've heard about this, guys, but when you've – tradition in the UK, when you've had a few drinks, a few pints, and you've been on a session, one of the, the traditions is to go for a greasy kebab or a greasy burger. Uh -huh. Cavemen weren't doing that. They weren't like <laughs> – <laughs> you know, they weren't – so things have changed uh -huh. with the, 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 the things that we put in our bodies, whether it comes to drugs or whether it comes to booze, you know? Well, and that's another part of it. Our food is different. People yes. talk about food addiction, and it's a bit of a controversial issue. But what we're really addicted to are the chemicals in many of our foods and the biological results that occur when we eat it. The dopamine hits, the serotonin lifts, and most of that is manufactured. You don't get that from broccoli. No. You don't get that from, you know, from uh, a, a piece of meat, but you do get that from the packaged mac and cheese or the yes. bag of chips. And that's part of what keeps people going and eating more because the yes. biology of it, first of all, we're not, we're not feeding our bodies nutrition. So our bodies are still hungry. And then the chemicals in our brain and in the rest of our bodies are calling us to eat more. So um, it's not easy to lose the weight and to keep it off. The challenge, like you said, Tom, is to keep it off. When you're dieting, yeah. there's a head, it's heady. You get on the scale, you see weight go down. It's exciting. When the weight stops dropping off and this is where you are, that mm. motivation isn't there anymore. And mm. so the desire to stay at the healthier size requires you to do whatever you did to get there. You have to stay there. And that's where people start to play a little fast and loose. Well, I tend like I'm. I'm once again. I'm very, very proud of what I've accomplished. Like, and, I'm proud like, of it, you too. It's a huge you. accomplishment. Thank I'm you. Not. It um, makes me look terrible. No, it does not, Alex. It does not. You, you, Alex has been under some of the most like rigorous mental strains you could possibly go through as a human oh. being. The fact that he emotionally deals with it in a healthy way every single day stop is being is, so. Is, stop being polite. Stop being polite. <laughs> beyond others, and like as as you were saying before, Doctor Sheila, like the comfort food of it all is very mm -hmm. easy to fall into. So yeah. you know, Alex can have an extremely stressful day being pulled in a thousand different directions. He's got this interview and that interview and. The biscuit needs to be done this and you sucks not doing that. And of course, you know, with the charity event coming up. Mm -hmm. So all these things coming up, it's it's just so easy. And I have no blame for him to reach over. Like a little bit of comfort food is not going to kill me. And it's not going to right now. And that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Um, but like I, I find that I've become so used to the way that I look now mm -hmm. that I have like this really like I unfortunately like I, I'm glad that you mentioned your psychologist because um like I find that I tend to have like the tiniest bit of what I refer to it and this is not a clinically diagnosed this is just my own personal thoughts because I mm -hmm. know what I'm thinking as I look at myself um I have like the tiniest form of like body dysmorphia where mm -hmm. as a 280 pound man if I was looking at myself I'd be like, wow, that dude's like thin. But now I look mm -hmm. at myself and I'm like, mm, yeah. Yeah. you're thin, 
but you're not tone and oh that extra skin mm-hmm. right there is not really good looking it, it's so mind-boggling how mm-hmm. like your how your parameters change yep. depending on where you are in life so uh, once again it's just it's very confusing so like that itself is enough to keep me motivated to because i mean like it's it's not the healthiest thing but i weigh myself every day I mm-hmm. check my intake. I weigh my food. I make sure that I'm not overindulging because, as I, mm-hmm. as I said before, my biggest problem is overeating still right. to this day. I'll, I'll intermediate fast for 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day. And then when I get to my meal, I'll be try- at first, I try to eat very slow because I've always heard that if you eat slower, it gives your body more time to adapt to the fact you have food in your stomach mm-hmm. and it recognizes it. So you right. don't tend to overeat. But, you know, I, once again, my, my stomach's used to just this mass quantity mm-hmm. of whatever it is. So it's like, no, 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 Tom, you can put a little bit more in there. It's okay. It's not a problem. Mm-hmm. And then I go to bed. I'm like, oh, what is wrong with you? You just don't mm-hmm. feel good anymore. And you feel so, so sick and so groggy. And it, it also has a lot to do with the chemical makeup of our food that we have that you you so wisely um Mm -hmm. compared to to mac and cheese mac Mm -hmm. and cheese if anyone knows anything about the wheat industry now like it's not the same wheat as 100 years ago by any stretch of the imagination we've had to manipulate it and change it to Mm -hmm. fit the needs of millions of americans so they could have this we access to them very easily um if you go over like i have a good friend over in italy and they have access to old world wheat where it's grown in smaller batches and she says the the pasta eating experience over there is is vastly different have you Mm -hmm. ever heard that Oh, I have. In fact, I've spent a year in Italy oh, and yeah, right. oh my goodness, it, I would live there in a heartbeat. But what I noticed is, was that their relationship to food is so different. When I lived there, I shopped every day. I bought a little bit for what I needed that day. I didn't go and do these bulk, you know, two or $400 shopping sprees that we do in the United States. And the food was fresher. It tasted better. I naturally ate smaller quantities. So even with the pizza and the gelato, I had a very healthy lifestyle there. So it's a different, yes. it's a different lifestyle. It's a different approach. It's it's also cheaper. Like if anyone's trying to shop on a budget, it is like if you look at the breakdown of what you spend, like a lot of the time when you go for these big bulk shops in Dumaram, like I, I'm very um, guilty of it as well. Like mm-hmm. we go to Costco, we buy, you know, I have three kids, you know, the household and all that stuff. So we always b- overbuy. Yeah. And that makes it like harder to maintain like because it's you know once again the ease of food it's so there. like hey i could definitely slice up some cheese and have some fruit mm-hmm. but hey that bag of chips is right there and all i have to do is just tear That's open right. the top right so with if, if you buy the food that you need for the day you don't have that much accessibility to that type of food you only have what you mm-hmm. have right and you have what you need by the way, a trick to that, having the chips around, put it, well, you're probably tall. I'm 5'3". So I actually need a step stool to get to the top shelf of my pantry. That's mm-hmm. where I leave all the good stuff. So that if I do want to treat myself, and there's nothing wrong with occasionally having junk food, there's mm-hmm. also nothing wrong with occasionally eating for emotional reasons. It's what you do most of the time that makes the difference. But uh, for me, okay. that extra step to have to go to get the step ladder out of the closet it actually creates that pause which makes me think, do I really want it? If I really want it, I get on the step and I pull it down. But sometimes when I'm on that step, I'm like, you know what? I don't really want it. And I put the step ladder away. What I attempt to do is I cable tie mouse traps onto the handles of my cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that in my next book, Alex. I love that idea. <laughs> That'll stop um, all of us. <laughs> Today, I mean, I've been doing keto, and we've been doing very, very well. Like I showed you my yeah. T-shirt. Mm-hmm. The only reason I've worn yeah. this today is because I've been out doing shoes and biscuits stuff. It's the only T-shirt I have, right? Mm-hmm. It's like double of me. Anyway, um, so we've been we doing, we doing amazingly well. I have a jawline, uh, and, and you know, I'm. It sounds this is going to sound like the weirdest, uh, probably most <laughs> way too personal thing to say, but. My tits are jiggling, right? And that yeah. means there I've lost go. loads of weight, right? That that you means have, that's yes. all loose skin, right? So mm-hmm. and I'm doing really well. But today, right, this is really funny because <laughs> I, I we we were like, I'm exhausted. I mean, I wiped out, walked miles. I've interviewed literally dozens of people today. Oh. I was like, let's go to the chippy. So we went to the chip shop, <laughs> right? And this is a British thing. So we literally had a bag of chips, right? Do, you, do bread- you have, wait a minute. Do you have a shop just for chips? Chip shop, yeah. Fish and chips. Oh, oh okay. fish and chips. Fish yeah, and yeah, chips. Yeah. I thought it was just chips, like potato chips. And I'm like, uh, I want to uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on my way. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, I should have known that. Like, I, it confused me as well, Dr. Sheila, because I was like, I know that. I'm like, I know what fish and yeah. chips. And I, yeah. I assume that's what he's talking about. But when you said it the way you did, because our, our, <laughs> our um, uncultured American ears heard you were like, a bag of chips store. That sounds amazing. I love it. broke chips. into the Cheetos factory. And we were there like, give go. me exactly. all your Cheetos. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> no, so, uh, 
I had a, I had a chip sandwich, a chip oh. bap, chip bap, which is a very yeah. British. We've we've spoken Excellent. about this before, Tom. Right, anyway, so uh, I, that's very not keto. So that's me slipping yeah. off keto for one day. Yeah. But I am not sitting there going, oh, "I'm such a fat bastard." I that's shouldn't have right. done that. That's terrible. That's I'm right. going. That's... I deserve this. I deserve yes. this. I've had a great day, and tomorrow mm-hmm. I'm going to come out of this looking yeah. like a hero because my body will go, "What the fuck's going on here?" And I'll lose a bit more weight. <laughs> right. I know that. I've and happened. you probably enjoyed every bite of those fish and chips because of your attitude. Because again, there's nothing wrong with reaching for something, but I instruct my clients to reach for it mindfully. So if you feel like you want to eat fish and chips or a a carton of ice cream, have it, but get the very best, sit down with the most beautiful bowl and a sterling silver spoon and just savor every bite. You'll enjoy it more, you'll eat less, and you'll be able to stop. Because when people eat mindlessly, they just start eating, they keep eating. And that's where the binges come in. So I tell my I never take food away from people. Life is about food. There's beautiful food out there. But just savor it. Enjoy it. Give yourself permission. And it makes a huge difference. And the overeating slows down when you give yourself that permission. Uh, if you if you, if ice cream is your thing, Doctor Sheila, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. shout out to uh, Millie's Ice Cream down in uh, Pittsburgh. It's a company that my sister works for. It's a very artisan ice cream. Yeah. They're they're very very clever and very very nice. Um, she she's she was uh she was the first one in my house that was like really into cooking. Like you know prior to that, food was just food, right? Like right. it's just something that would show up at the table at nighttime. Mm-hmm. And my mom would throw on there, but right. my little sister was the you know she was never afraid to be herself. She's a very daring girl, and that's one of the things I love the most about her. Other than just of course being my sibling Mm -hmm. and she kind of gave me a new appreciation for food and what goes into food and like what you can expect from food it just doesn't have to be something that you know fills you it can be like an experience like you were saying and i think that's very important to distinguish the two in between um now i when i started keto my keto journey um like my body had to get used to it they call it the keto (laughs) flu um no of course no problem at all um and all sorts of other things i find that my body has changed not for the worse, but for the better, because like, it doesn't um, put up with my shenanigans any longer. Mm-hmm. Like I might have like uh like the thing that I noticed, the thing that, that uh, messes with me the most is like hard carbs. Like, and I'm not mm-hmm. saying like potatoes or something along those lines, the natural good carbs. I'm saying like, like the very processed overly carbs, right. like a bread or a pasta. Mm-hmm. When I tend to overindulge in something like that, my stomach nowadays um, likes to ferment with all that stuff. Things so it doesn't know what to do with it anymore. It mm-hmm. used to be so used to being able to break down these large quantities of food. And now it's like, What'd you just put in me? Like I, yeah, I get yeah, like I some this, I've, my body does that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't agree with everything I that I make choice. Is is that something that's true, or is that just something that's in my mind? Is my body make up differently now that I've treated it so differently for so long? Your body wants to be healthy, and left to its own devices, it will guide you to the right foods, to the right amount of foods, and so forth. My general approach is a non diet approach. But if people come to me and say they they like the keto program or they like Weight Watchers or something, that's fine. We can work hmm. with it. But when you give your body permission, your body wants to be healthy. So if you're following a keto diet, you're eating really clean, and now all of a sudden you throw a brick in it, yeah. and it's like, whoa, wait a minute, I don't know. It takes a while. <laughs> You know, the body will react. And that's why in the beginning, when you were changing from the regular, we call it the standard American diet, that sad, horrible diet to keto, your body was literally detoxing the chemicals and all the other impurities that had been filling it. That's the carb, uh, the keto flu. Yes. And then once it's out of your system and you stay clean, you're good. Once you start putting the stuff back in, the symptoms come back. And after a while, it becomes your new normal and you don't feel the symptoms anymore. I find the other problem to be is that keto is like a land of extremes. Like as much Mm -hmm. as the American diet is the land of like the the complete opposite end of the spectrum, keto is the other end of the spectrum where it's like, no, we're taking out anything you might, you know, really enjoy. And it teaches Mm -hmm. you to, to like, I wasn't a big cheese fan prior to this. Like Mm -hmm. the cheese, you know, fine, whatever. But now I'll eat like, you know, just cheese slice, Mm -hmm. you know, eat it delicious. Um, The reason I was saying that was because um, like when you do that, like it, it might be good for a little while, but I know people that try to stay on keto for years. And I'm like, mm-hmm. but your body doesn't want that though. Like yeah. it's a good way to like teach yourself to be mindful of what you're putting in your body, mm-hmm. but that's not a good way to be your entire life. Because like, if anyone knows anything about your muscles, your muscles need the carbs to be mm-hmm. able to continue to build muscle. And once you start losing that, like what happens then? Oh, right. good. That, that, means, that means like my arms and my shoulders are hurting from today. Well, that's because of, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Cause they're, my chip, they're, 
carbohydrate <laughs> starved right now. That's part of the thing. Like it's yeah. besides from losing the water weight, aside from mm -hmm. using just an excessive amount of healthy fats and whatnot, like your body's not really ingesting any carbohydrates whatsoever. That's why the net carb count is so low to be uh -huh. able to do it. It's a good way to hack your body, but it's not really like a healthy way to live. You'll never see like a bodybuilder do using keto to maintain his regimen. That's just not oh. something that's physical. Oh, yeah, all possible. I do is eat I eat elk, baby. That's all I do is I eat elk. I go out there and shoot it with my bow and arrow. No, I'm just that's much of a rogue impression. Um <laughs> she, she, <laughs> Sheila, where does this all be all begin for you? What what made when you were younger and you wanted to do this uh -huh. as a career, what was it about you that wanted to go out there and help people? I mean you could have gone and done anything with your life. Right. Um, but you chose to do this. It's, a, right? it's such a good question. So um, I don't know how much of my bio you read, but I actually started my professional life as a lawyer. And I got through law school I eating that, peanut yeah. M&Ms. Yeah. And um, at the end of law school, I was 35 pounds heavier than I started, but I had my law degree. And I remember thinking I wanted to write a letter to the M&M company thanking them. <laughs> what I didn't know then was that I was eating for emotional reasons. I was eating to cope. And then when I decided that law wasn't for me and I went back to grad school to study psychology, that's when I started to make the connection between eating and emotions. And so because it was a topic that was interesting to me, but not a topic that completely flattened me, I remember my doctoral uh, dissertation chair said to me, pick a topic that you're interested in, but isn't your issue, like you're not going to get stuck in it. So I'm one of the lucky ones. I never developed a full-blown eating disorder, but I do understand the relationship between emotions and eating. And that got me on my path. And then after about 20 years, I was noticing that some of my clients were getting it emotionally, but they still weren't making the changes. And that's when I learned about my mindfulness, I brought the mindfulness in. And to me, now this is the missing piece. And when you're mindful, you're more in touch with your body, your body will guide you. And eventually the weight that you need to lose will come off. It's not a quick weight loss program. Keto gets the weight off faster. This non-diet approach goes slower. But in my opinion, in my experience, it has longer lasting results because you're listening to your body and you're getting the carbs when you need them. And you're getting the protein when you need them because you're listening. It takes a while to tune in. But once you tune in, the guidance is very clear. It's like a GPS system. It'll get mm. you where you want to go. I'm very interested in this, actually. Like, I mean, like, generally speaking, like when we interview people, I like to hear everyone's story, of course, mm -hmm. because everyone has, is very interesting in their own rights. But I got to say, Dr. Shelley, you're like one of the first ones I'm like, oh, I like when we're done with this, I'm going to continue looking into this because I've been, mm -hmm. of course, in the back of my mind looking for a, a better and healthier way to maintain mm -hmm. what, I've, what I've become used to. And I, f I find that your method and I, I'm just putting it as your method because you're the first one to explain it to me. I, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it, you know, anyone else has expressed it before and I want to dismiss any anybody of course but like mm -hmm. from from what i understand from what you said like the way that you've kind of broke it down seems to be a really good way to kind of like maintain um uh, my expectations of myself now in, yes. a, in a healthy way yes and it is about taking the time to get to know yourself and trust yourself the way that i teach mindful eating it's on a foundation of meditation one of the first skills i teach is mindfulness meditation and what that does is two things one it calms the whole body down so if you're a stress eater, you tend to eat less stress because you're feeling less stress. Also, mindfulness um, meditation teaches you to focus and to create a pause between a thought and a response. And so many of us eat automatically. When we come home, the minute we do, we go in the refrigerator, we pull out that old slice of pizza and we're there. When, when you're mindful, you just create that pause. It's like me and the step stool. When I put that step stool, it creates a pause. Do I still want the cookies? If I do, I take them. But in that moment, I get to think about it. If the cookies were on the counter, I probably would have just grabbed them and not created that pause. Not even and that pause about is it. what's the mindfulness. <laughs> What'd you say, Alex? <laughs> not, not even thought about it. Cookies in your mouth. And you're like, oh, man. I wasn't oh, man. Yeah, how are these cookies get here? <laughs> right. I understand the cookie monster's problems now. Um, and I see uh, the empty box. I'm like, where did they all go? <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a whole box here a minute ago. Some <laughs> right. ghost or spirit or apparitions the eating my only cookies. Explanation. Um, only explanation. Only <laughs> explanation. So I'm, I'm very glad that you said that because that's something that I have a big problem with. And I, I'm sorry about making this all about me. It's just this is how I'm relating to the whole situation, especially trying to like like, I'm very hands on. So, like, to mm -hmm. grasp everything that you're giving me, Dr. Sheila, I got to kind of like, I got to be self centered and put it into my, but, you know, life. You know I got to be like, what about me? You have to do that. I teach uh, psychology at the college level. And the first day of class, I say to my students, make this about you. As you're All reading right. the textbook, as you're in lecture, apply it to your own life. How will okay. this change your life? That's how you learn. So, I have no objection. I don't know how Alex feels, but I have no objection that you're making this all about you. No, 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 it's all about empathy at the end of the day. Like, yes. what, what, when I when I talk about 
myself in, in, in you know using that as for an interview uh-huh. i'm doing that because i'm trying to understand how somebody else feels so i look at my own experiences yes. it's, it's empathy yes. it's really very it important it's, it's absolutely empathy yes um so when i get home from work um i work a night shift i don't need anything at the job i find that that makes it too comfortable uh-huh. and i get tired like if i think about like my high school career um math class was right after lunch and i would eat this like very large lunch the american lunch and uh-huh. i'd get back i'm like i can't learn anything right now i'm exhausted <laughs> yeah. i'm just wiped out Correct. so i don't eat anything um uh-huh. at, at work and that's part of my intermediate fasting but then i'll get home and i'll be ravished like i just uh-huh. used up everything i had to like walk a, i walk a lot at work and I, I used up anything that i had stored and i'm there in the morning and i'm finally in my house i'm comfortable i'm trying to get ready for bed and I just start reaching and I don't okay. really, like, I try to be mindful about the whole situation. Uh-huh. Like, okay, well, like an egg or two and like a slice of bacon, that'd be cool. Uh-huh. You know, no breads, whatever it might be. But then I'm like, well, that, that chopped salad's going to go bad if I don't eat uh-huh. that really quick. But I don't yeah. want to eat food that once again, you should buy uh-huh. what you're going to use um, and on things along those lines. So I'm glad to hear that it's actually like a thing that everybody goes through, not just myself, everybody. But- uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's a good way to combat that? Like, I, I, I feel like my body is hungry when uh-huh. I get home, but is it really uh-huh. hungry at that point? Or am that's, I just so used that's, to the feeling? That's like the, the question taste. that you have to ask. And the question that I encourage is, what am I really hungry for? Mm. And if you are physically hungry, then broccoli and a chicken breast will sound delicious. If you're emotionally hungry, not a chance. If you're emotionally hungry, it's going to be about, the, the for me, the ice cream, the cookies, the chips, the whatever. So that's one question you can ask yourself. What am I really hungry for? And if the answer is I want a hard-boiled egg or I want some salad, then you probably are physically hungry. And then my suggestion is make a meal out of it. Sit down, set the table, eat it, as opposed to just throwing the egg in your mouth and then running over to the next part of your day. Really make that moment. That will separate the physical from the emotional hunger. If you're physically hungry, eat. If you're emotionally hunger, hungry, address whatever it is. You might be tired. You might need a hug from your wife and your kids. You know, <laughs> um, you, you're probably more up to date on the research and the information than I am. Is it still considered bad to eat before you go to bed, or have they flip flopped on that again? You know, you can find ten studies that say it's bad and ten studies that say it's good. Okay. Um, I I happen to not like to go to bed hungry. I might notice that around nine o'clock, I physically feel hungry. So I'll have a banana maybe. And I do. And I eat and then I get into bed and I'm fine. But other people, they can't do that. They, they need to go to sleep on an empty stomach. So again, it's about what does your body need? And if I have a, that banana, then I go to sleep. I'm great. I wake up the next morning. There's no guilt. I wouldn't recommend binge food before bed because that's usually emotional eating. Yeah. So I'm not reaching yeah. for the junk food. I'm thinking I'm hungry. Like if I'm hungry, I'm distracted. I can't relax. I can't fall asleep. And I grab a banana. And the I banana need to be busy. I need to be busy. busy. I, I, yeah. I need to be busy because I intermittent mm-hmm. fast, right? So I don't mm-hmm. eat breakfast or lunch. Right. And, mm-hmm. and and the same with because I work nights. I'll mm-hmm. have a meal before I go to work. And then yeah. I'll just work through the night and go to bed when I get back. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's how I do things. That and works I need for to be you. busy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. when I've when I'm like, ah, oh, got nothing to do. Let's just sit down and watch the telly. Um yeah. and that's when my mind's like, Oh my god, did you remember how nice Oreos were? They were just <laughs> yeah. amazing. <isn't> it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh yeah. man, we're those so great, Alex. I mean, you really <laughs> can go for some Oreos. Right? I'm like, body, I just went through all that work. And you're like, No, 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 bro. Oreos, they're very mm-hmm. important. <laughs> I think it's on top of the food pyramid of it, it is it is it Great definitely area. it's actually on the yeah. bottom you want a lot of them do, yeah, do you yeah. have alex <laughs> in, in the uk do you have a different variety of of oreos or you just have the traditional? yeah they've, they've slowly the started. America, yeah, oh, yeah there's so many now <laughs> I, we've got um we've got a, a, a an american sweet shop called molly's here and so mm-hmm. you can go in and buy like your your airheads and things like this you know right. they're very expensive but like the range of Oreos, you got peanut butter and uh, <laughs> chocolate orange and yeah, or whatever it is that right. they're selling. All of yeah. Them. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I'm, yeah. I made a uh, fried Oreos. I mean, they're not healthy whatsoever. But um, we went to the right. fair. We, yeah, yeah, fried Oreos. They're excellent. I'm not gonna lie, man. Like, if you really just want to kill yourself slowly but enjoy every second of it, fried Oreos are way to go. Sounds like a Scottish um, like, contraption. No, they they. Yeah. they Oh, is it? You want to talk about the difference? We fry everything in the United yes. States, including butter. You can get fried butter at, at uh, county fairs and things like that. So, Funnily yeah, not enough, for me. Um, no. Dr. Fried Twinkies. 
Yes, um, <laughs> but funnily enough, Alex is 100% right. The Scots are actually the ones that really oh, invented this whole trend. Oh, of fr- they have like, fried pizza. They have fried, like, we think we're bad. Fried Mars they bar. Do everything. That's where the fried <laughs> Mars bar. That's exactly. It <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. So I made fried I Oreos because mm-hmm. I spent, um, we went to the fair the, as a family. It was a cool, like, little thing yeah. before school started. Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. Yeah. And I don't eat this type of food a lot, but I was like, oh, man, I'm here. You know, this is, I'm, this is the experience I'm paying for. So, like, let's have a fried Oreo, too. And I paid eight bucks for six. I'm like, dude, what's the overhead they're getting <laughs> right now? Like, the percent margin must just be outlandish. And I, I bought a package of Oreos. I bought a thing of Bisquick. And I was like, they're getting, like, a 300% markup on these things. I need to open a fried Speaking Oreo. Speaking about stand. markup, I, I've just come back from this food festival. I'm not going to mention the bar's name um because i like the bar right they're very they're the friends of the shrewsbury biscuit right um okay. but i was very hot because it's a very hot day today i caught the sun a bit and i went to this bar which was at the festival and i was like can i have a glass of lemonade i watch her pick up a bottle of bassett's lemonade which is just a normal make of lemonade uh-huh. pour it into a glass and go she did two because that's for two and she goes that's six pound please it's three pound each for <laughs> Bassett's lemonade, which cost a quid off the shelf. I watched her pour it into the cup and I gave her my money. <laughs> Feel so dirty. See, the thing is, like, um, at, at like most American fairs, Alex, like when you get lemonade or something, they actually have like these actual stands and they come in like this plastic cup that's collectible. Uh-huh. You can bring them home with you and stuff, mm-hmm. but they'll squeeze them lemons right in front of you. So, uh-huh. like, if you're going to pay for like a lemonade, oh, this here, was next door to a home lay- homemade lemonade stand. Why'd you go there? Because that was even more expensive. Like, You're the problem. Because <laughs> she's like, there's rooms like this that pay six dollars or six quid for, for the lemonade. You're the problem, Alex, with society. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when it comes to um, your, your clientele and the people that you yeah. that you help out, um, yeah. Sheila, um, what's the general sort of feedback? Like, I mean, I, I, I don't want you to blow your own trumpet or, you know, even talk badly about yourself, mm-hmm. but there must be a community that you've developed with the, the common thing is you, you're the person that's helped them, right? Right. So I, fortunately, I get a lot of positive feedback, which makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm on the right path, but everybody's different. Some people resist the idea of giving up dieting because I say my mm. approach is generally a non-diet approach. But again, if somebody comes and they're committed to something, I'll work with that. They also resist the fact that it takes a long time. This is not a quick fix. Yes. And some people initially will gain weight with my approach because I say, you can eat whatever you want. And people often interpret that to mean they can eat whatever they want, meaning mm-hmm. a quantity. And, and that's not exactly what it is, but there's a little bit of that backlash. Um, and then what others people find is that foods that they thought that they loved they don't like so much anymore. It's like if you actually, well, maybe not Oreos for you, but if you took a food that you really liked and you ate it slowly and really tasted it. I remember I did this during, when I was in my training for mindful eating awareness, I used Cheetos and I would put it in and I would just sort of suck it. And once I sucked it, I realized that the outside was all that cheesy flavor, but the inside was like styrofoam. Yes. And I was like, Ugh. and all of a sudden Cheetos not became no longer like a favorite food of mine because I really gave myself permission to taste it. And so people don't like that either. They're like, you know, well, if I, if I love Cheetos, I was like, well, maybe you don't try them if you do eat them. But if you don't, don't, because it's really a quality, it's a quality over quantity kind of approach. I I wonder if it's like, um, the, like companies depend on you eating it quickly. Like nobody generally does that. Nobody takes a Dorito and does exactly as you just described, put it in their mouth Mm -hmm. and let it absorb and like take in the flavor like you would a good popcorn. Popcorn, like for example, you're at cinema and what are you doing? You grab big hands of popcorn and you smash it into your mouth, don't you? You know? (laughs) Yeah. If you actually tasted it, it's cardboard. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Unless it has all the butter flavor and the salt. So I, mm. I, the research that I have read, I'm aware that manufacturers do, you know, formulate their products in a way that stimulates taste, that can mm. stimulate the dopamine receptors in our brain. So there's mm. some of that going on. But part of mindful eating is slowing down and really tasting your food. And if it's wonderful, enjoy it. If it's not so wonderful, put it aside and find something else. Um, mm. And that's a process. And so to answer your question, Alex, most people, they want something quick, immediate, 
And I'm going, I can't guarantee weight loss. This is going to take a while. But at the end, you'll be at peace with food. You'll be at peace with your body. There's no more of that fighting. You can trust yourself that if you go, like you said, Alex, at the end of the day and you have some fish and chips, the next day you're fine. It's not the beginning of a binge that lasts 30 days. That's the gift of mindful eating. But in the beginning, some people are like, no, I want it. I want it now. And I'm like, well, okay. I want it all. (laughs) I, I don't want. I don't want to speak disparagingly about anyone's diet choices. And oh, I do. For you, right? These <laughs> um, I, like, If it works for you and it's a healthy mm-hmm. course of yeah. action, then I really don't want yeah. to take anything away from people. But mm-hmm. like, I I'm good friends with these guys, and they're um they're uh, you know they're a married couple, very very beautiful people. I love them mm-hmm. so much, and they do this um weird diet thing where you have to like purchase this food from this company yeah. mm-hmm. and like it's it's yeah. very it's very keto s because i look at the ingredients and stuff like mm-hmm. that but i'm like i can't pronounce half the stuff in here so yeah. how good can it be for you yeah. but they swear by it. they both lost weight through mm-hmm. their pro through the stuff what do you I'm think sure about diets like that and once again not i'm not asking this question so you could bash on anyone else's diet yeah. i don't feel that you would but i, I just want to put that disclaimer out there just so people know that we're not here to talk crap but at the same t- but at the same time people yeah. are gullible though aren't they and they will just jump onto mm-hmm. a fad diet mm-hmm. of Oh, yeah, replace your meals with this shake. It'll change your life. Give us all of your money, you know? (laughs) It's made of lemonade, too, right? um... (laughs) I'm I'm back on it. I'm back on it. Oreo flavored lemonade. (laughs) Oreo flavored lemonade. In your Um, experience, those diets. You know, the truth is, all the diets work. In the end, diets work. Whether you're on a keto diet or a prepackaged food diet or a Weight Watchers type of diet, they work because in the interim, in the in the immediate, you are reducing the amount of food you're eating. And in the end, the body really needs less food than what we're feeding it. And when you mm. feed it less food, it lets go of the excess that you have. So all the diets work. The question becomes, can you do it forever? Mm. Because if you can't do it forever, then you're going to find yourself three months, six months, three years from now back where you were in the beginning, maybe even worse. So that's why I say to people, if whatever you're doing now, imagine, can you do this forever? If you can do it forever, you're on the right kind of program. But if you can't do it forever, then let's take a step back and try a different approach. I I wonder if like I wonder if all these certain diets, including the one that I did as well, very strapping, my good survey. I was like, oh my god, I could redo really my glasses. I looked and they were there on my bed. I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I wonder if it all kind of comes full circle to something that you've already figured out, um, Doctor Sheila, which is you know the mindfulness of eating, because mm-hmm. like all these diets have one thing in common. It, you know, all the everything changes about the way that you go about it, mm-hmm. but the the thought process and the food and because uh-huh. you are now on this diet and you have to think about your food, uh-huh. I wonder if right. it all kind of comes full circle to what you're doing right yeah. now, which is just being mindful and being aware of what you're putting in your body. Right. And when you're following a diet, you're mindful of, am I following the rules? Am I doing yeah. it the way I'm supposed to be doing? So you're very conscious. Yes. And then the flip side of that is mindless eating where people just don't want to pay attention. It's the popcorn in the cinema where all of a sudden you're at the bottom of the bowl and you're like, I don't remember starting it. And that's where you're not paying attention. So diets cause you to focus initially. um, And that's part of why there's weight loss associated with it, which is great. But again, the question for me is, can you live with it forever? Because otherwise you're going to revert back to your old eating habits. And what, you know, we are the product of our habits. So the body I have now is a result of the food I choose, the exercise I choose, how I manage my stress, how much sleep I get. If any of that thing shifts, my body will reflect that. So if you're dieting for a while, that's great. But if you go back to the old way, don't be surprised if that old body shows up again after a while. I, I feel like with you, because because uh, you're a psychologist and, you know, you kind of – when it comes to eating loads, say like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, every like three nights out of the four, you're sitting there and you're shoving a, a peanut M&Ms in there while you're watching mm-hmm. movies, doing a Harry Potter marathon and every single movie you watch, you're going to shove mm-hmm. your face full of carbs, right? Um mm-hmm. Uh, when I was doing that personally, it's because when people ask me about my body image, I'm like, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Low self-esteem. I don't yeah. care how I look because I don't I don't right. care about me. Right. right. So uh, you can really help people by breaking yeah. down what is breaking someone's self-esteem, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the I don't care is an emotional e- is an emotional issue. Why don't you mm-hmm. care? Why don't you care enough about yourself to take care of yourself? It's like if you have a car that you love right? You get the oil changed, you wash it, you make sure the, t- air, the tires have enough air in them. When you love your body the same way, and I know that sounds kind of woo-woo in very California, but when you love your body that same way, <clears throat> excuse me, you take care of it similarly. 
you make choices. You know, do you put premium gas in your car or the cheap gas? You put the premium in. Do you put the premium food in your body? Or do you put the cheap stuff? So part of it is learning to care about yourself. And some of the meditations that I teach people have to do with loving kindness, which is about taking care of yourself. Body scan meditation, which is about becoming comfortable in your own body. And mm. then you make decisions from that point. And again, I never say no to an Oreo, but just, you know, be mindful of how you're choosing it and why you're choosing it. Well, I find that we can come very complacent very easily. Like my wife, um, you know, very, very lovely lady. She, she's always never cared about my, my weight. Like she never uh -huh. wanted, like she met me as a bigger dude. So she's like, uh -huh. clearly she never has cared about my weight. Um, it in fact was not her. She doesn't even like particularly like the fact, I mean, she puts up with the fact that I'm as thin as I am. And like, you uh -huh. know, she's like, Oh, I can pick you up and things along those lines. But <laughs> she was never pushing for the uh -huh. fact for me to lose weight. Right. It was really something that happened with my daughter. Um, uh -huh. she was, um, she got me this shirt for Christmas, um, this uh, really ridiculous uh, turtle shirt. It's something very, uh, very much a what tourist a shirt. shirt man. It is a turtle <laughs> shirt, man. And it just has like some sea turtles on it or something, something you'd get like the Bahamas. Like, right. I was like, oh, this would be, you know, little Timmy mm -hmm. would love this XYZ. And um, she got this shirt for me because the school had this bazaar where you brought in a couple quarters, you got to go to a table, pick up a gift, and then you had a Christmas gift for your family, yeah. which is excellent. Daughter gets me the gift. I try it on. I, I'm like a sausage trying to squeeze into another yeah. sausage, and it's just yeah. no good and i didn't like it i was like well dad can't fit in now but someday uh -huh. and then um that spring before summer let out um i was picking up my kids and my daughter got off and we were we have a very close relationship me and my daughter and um she just seemed kind of down i noticed she was yeah. down i was like hey kid what's wrong she's like nothing and i was like no no what's what's up would something bother you on the bus she's like well the kids on the bus were making fun of you and i was like oh what like why yeah. like you know what's wrong with dad man dad's fun and she's like yeah but they were just calling you fat and I was oh. like, oh, that's what that yeah. is. I'm like, and I realized that my my multitude of, of, of <laughs> years that I spent, like, just mm -hmm. not caring kind of became this thing that is now could potentially ostracize my daughter from the rest yeah. of her friends because her friends yeah. don't, friends' parents don't look like me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and of course, anything different, kids tend to poke and prod at. So right. I'm not going to let her live a harder life based mm -hmm. on my horrible choices getting mm -hmm. to the point that I am now. And that's what really started this whole thing. So I, I, I fortunately had a very healthy mindset to go from to, mm -hmm. to go with this diet right. thing. But because my wife loved me as much and still loves me as much as she does, mm -hmm. I didn't really care what I looked like per se. Mm -hmm. Because normally that's something you do when you're trying to woo somebody or trying to gain the acceptance of somebody. The only reason I'm losing this weight, Tom, is for you. It's only is it? for you. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. don't have to. Across the ocean. <laughs> I want to smolder for you on the podcast. <laughs> I feel like yeah. you're just one ear cut away from me, Van Gogh, and be like, I did this for you. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I love me and my art. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Amazing. You um, know, your, your comment about your wife is beautiful. She loves you unconditionally and it doesn't matter what you look like. And that's a beautiful thing. Yes. What is important to me is how do you feel about you? And if yeah. you feel good about yourself, even if you are at a larger size, that's fine. Um, in fact, a part of the mindful eating approach is really about it's not about the weight. Hmm. You know, you may end up being exactly. Exactly the same weight, but how you feel about yourself will change, how your relationship with food has changed, how you cope with your emotions has changed. And so it's not so much about the size. And I don't know what's going on in the UK, but there's a huge movement going on in the United States called Healthy at Every Size or like fat acceptance, the idea that we all come in different shapes and sizes. And even if one of us is a little bigger than what we expect, it doesn't make them a bad or horrible person. They can still be healthy and you know productive and all of that. So it's less about the weight and more about the relationship with oneself and food from my approach. The weight comes off if it needs to, but sometimes it doesn't need to. People have um, sort of fantasies. You know, I'm 60 years old. I'll never weigh what I weighed at 22. So who am I kidding? Right. But I yeah. feel good about what I am now at this stage in life. And that's well, you what look matters. You look amazing. And I never would have guessed. Oh, do I? Thank you. 60. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, and that's yay. something to be said because these Zoom cameras, <laughs> they're very tricky. And you're just like, oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> thank you for saying that, because like I find my biggest problem and something I, I, I tend to fall into. And I don't know why I do it anymore, especially being a guy that was mm -hmm. of a particular size not too long ago. I'll see other people that are struggling with the weight. And I instantly be like, oh, why aren't you doing more for yourself? Like, I, mm -hmm. I feel bad, but I feel like I'm getting really judgy at the same mm -hmm. time. And I, 
it's not a good place to be in mm-hmm. because it's not that I never say it to them. I never go up to mm-hmm. them like you have problems, but like my head, I'm like, why do I go there? Like, why do mm-hmm. I as a person all of a sudden, you know, even though I understand their 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 issues, how come I am a person that feels like they can now judge somebody for what their I, life choices are? I, I think it's partly how we're how our society views people who carry extra weight. I have a client right now who by, you know, objective standards is carrying excess weight, let's say about 100 more pounds. But our work is not about losing weight. Our work is about her claiming herself and being proud of herself. And her self-esteem, to Alex's point, is starting to skyrocket. And she hasn't lost a pound, but how she feels about herself has changed. Whether that will result in weight loss, I don't know. But it almost doesn't matter. She's got healthy blood work. You know, when she goes to the doctor, everything's where it's supposed to be. But and she's middle aged. So it's, it's not at that stage where you, if you're 20, you still have blood, good blood work. You're middle aged. Your blood work is still good. But she's coming into her own and she says, this is who I am. Good. Oh. And it's, it's the most beautiful thing. She finally mm. let go. She says, I don't want to diet. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to love myself for who I am. And it started because she became familiar with that movement, health at every size. And we brought it in. This is a, a psychotherapy patient of mine. And we brought it into our work. And it's mm. fantastic. And so it's not about the weight. It's about the relationship you have with yourself, with others, and with food. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's about having that strength and that, uh, you know, uh, that encouragement that you that you give. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, I learned, I learned somewhere that sometimes you've got to learn to fight for yourself. You can't, you can't mm-hmm. just accept health off others. That's Kelda Wood that told me that is a, uh, she mm-hmm. will be at pod eight guys. Kelda Wood is amazing. And she does, uh, she works for a charity called climbing out. She works mm-hmm. with people with PTSD and people mm-hmm. that have had traumas in their life. Yeah. And then rather than going, let's sit and talk about it. You know, mm-hmm. let's, let's do this. She's like, no, let's go climb a mountain. Let's go, mm-hmm. let's go find, let's go right. some, do some challenges and we'll fight this thing. Mm-hmm. Like that fucking thing that's in your head. will. And mm-hmm. I love that because yeah. after that, you are strong and you've got yeah. that confidence. And that sounds like what that lady's done right now. She's gone, mm-hmm. no, there's enough, enough is enough. Let's do mm-hmm. this. And I, I think that's right. really, really powerful. I, I love that. Yes. I watched yeah. recently a, um, a true crime story on American TV and it was about a young woman who had been raped. It took years and years. They finally found her rapist and she confronted him in, in court. He went to jail. And what happened for her afterwards was incredible because she stayed the course because she fight, she fought her whole experience of herself and of that event has changed. And it gave me a little goosebumps at the very end of the interview with her when she was saying, I'm empowered. I'm going to raise my children now from this state of mind. And it was because she did the hard stuff. She Mm. followed through with it. And I'm not, this is not a criticism of rape victims who choose not to. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that because she did the hard stuff, she shifted her relationship with herself. She now feels like she's empowered and she's powerful Mm, when she used to feel like a victim and blamed herself for being raped, which is a conversation all in itself. That yeah. she felt that, responsible for that happening to her. That was, you know. That happened with the uh, the guy that uh, molested those girls for the gym, the American gymnasts as well, didn't uh, it? Yes, yeah. Yes, they all got mm-hmm. to have a piece of him, and I love that. Mm-hmm. That's so yeah. powerful. Oh, they all got to say their mind, speak their mind. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my pursuit of like always trying to like stay healthy, uh-huh. um, do you find there to be any merit? I, I don't know if you've ever heard the the theory that like we're supposed to eat what's like what we've grown accustomed to as like um like okay so we we all you know up until the point where pangea was broken up and we had different continents and Uh we cures came from different places it's quite a while ago tom yeah it was it was was like yesterday (laughs) or something right i I don't remember i think it was big news maybe i was still Um, i was a little kid i remember (laughs) (laughs) in our lifetime in our lifetime excellent so like there's something to be said about eating what's local to you and what your body is like in your ancestors grew up do you find there to be any merit to that train of thought like like instead of like eating like the Mediterranean diet, which is not in anywhere of my genetic makeup, uh-huh. I would eat something more that's European or Indian or Italian. Are you Italian? Is, is any, uh, yeah, I'm Italian. <laughs> I'm American Indian. I'm a uh, jeez man. I must have told you my grand my grand my uh, great uncles in the mob. I must have told you that. Yeah, you did. Anyways, that's like, yeah, else. it's a Bruno. Oh, oh my god. It's a Bruno. Bruno. <laughs> yeah, if you have, well, if you ever, if you ever, if you know anything about, you know, the mafia back in like the seventies yeah. and eighties, there's a gentleman named Angelo Bruno who mm-hmm. was the dom of uh, Philadelphia, and all my family's from South Jersey, and it's the I whole see. thing. Like, if you look at my family, it's very interesting because, like, my grandfather went to the Marines. He's he served our country in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. He's a, he was a great guy. I love my grandfather to death. Tom Bruno, go figure. And um, <laughs> he's like, if you look at, it, you're like, wow, there's a lot of correlations between you. 
and the Corleone family because you have <laughs> one that became in the mafia and the other one that rejected the whole thing. And it's very intriguing. Nothing based on us whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that the lines are there. Um, but with that being said, do you find there to be any merit of like eating something that our body has grown accustomed <laughs> to over generations and not maybe eating something that's, you know, so far out from our dietary expectations that um, it might react negatively? Is there something about that? It, that's a great question. So there is evolutionary psychology studies and other research that says that we, um, when we grow up in, we're, we're, when our ancestors come from a certain area, we are more prone to taste. Our taste will be that a certain way. For example, like um, I'm German and Polish, and I can't eat anything with spice. I'm as oh. white as they come, white skin, white girl, can't eat spice. I remember being in Thailand once and learning two words in Thai, my pet, which means no spice. <laughs> and even their version of no spice was too spicy for me. Whether that's because my heritage comes from Eastern Europe, I don't know. But what I do know is that we do acclimate to the foods that are around us. Mm. So if and, and part of the reason that the standard American diet is so pervasive is because that's what's around us. Yes. Um, So I don't know exactly the evolution, but I know that people talk about we should eat the way our ancestors ate. There is something to be said that our physicality has not changed that much over you know these hundreds of thousands of years. So we really haven't grown to adapt to the new food sources. But I don't think that means I know Alex likes elk, but I don't think that means the rest of us should just eat elk because that's what was on on the the American continent back in the day. So I don't know too much more about it than to offer you that. I don't, I don't eat elk, by the way. That was me doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, is that, that an was, impression uh, of somebody? It was, yeah, that was yeah, my yeah. Joe Rogan impression. Oh, I mean, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I missed yeah. that. Okay. No, yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm Irish. Um, I'm Irish. Uh, so like mm-hmm. yeah, going on those things, uh, potatoes are very Do you boring. like potatoes? Yeah. 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 Potato. Um, oh, yeah. I don't like, I don't like borscht. Um, I, my father really? uh, loved borscht. I don't like borscht. I, What's that thing? Uh, American, uh, <laughs> not German, sauerkraut. Sauerkraut. Oh, sauerkraut's yeah. delicious. Oh my goodness. That really? or kimchi. See? Oh, I love it see? so, so much. Right. Um, I, I'm I, well, no, I I'll like eat the I pasta like... from Italy, but you can have the sauerkraut from Germany. So, <laughs> well, also like my Mom, me and you, me and you, love Sheila. My mom to death. Okay, let me just throw it out there before I criticize my mother. I love her to death. She, you know, for a long time, she was working a full time job and maintaining mm-hmm. a house. So she was yeah. very, she became very accustomed to the ease in food. Like, so hamburger helper became a staple. Oh, yes. But one thing my mom still prides herself on is she still cooks her sour in the same exact way that her grandmother taught her to make her sour. Oh, wow. Like, favorite thing like if my mom hasn't seen me in a little bit even though she lives right down the road and stuff she'd be like hey do you want to go over for dinner i'd be like oh mom you know we got busy we got the kids are going to school she's like i'm making sour brown i was like yeah yeah totally I'll be yeah, right there, I'll right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right there you, you keep that gravy warm up here right there ma it's delicious um that's so <laughs> my parents came to the united states around the time that all those practical foods became the thing the swanson's oh, no. tv dinners the the uh, rice aronis and the hamburger helpers and my mother thought she died and went to heaven that's all i ate growing up <laughs> Well, she came um, from a land of like, you know, uh, the, the Great Depression and stuff like, yeah, I think yeah. Of like after World War Two, when right. Germany was in was decimated, mm-hmm. of course, yeah. you know, because of what happened with the mm-hmm. war, um, yeah. they, they were basically like, hey, um, you went from having zero food to zero mm-hmm. nutrition to having all the food you could possibly want for Dixie <laughs> Cheap and right. Welcome to America. <laughs> You're so it's, happy. Like, yeah. it's like literally you get to Ellis Island, like, here's a cheeseburger. Right. Now, exactly. You're American. Yeah. So I never yeah. learned to cook. Um, no, because really? I just, I can open a package. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, my parents were, were survivors from the second world war. So when they came to the United States, it was a whole new world for them. And my mother was thrilled did with your, all the packaged foods. Did your mother have a different relationship with food as well? Like my mom, like she has a, because her family is a, her parents were as mm-hmm. old as they were like, uh, she wouldn't let me throw anything away. If food was like outdated by a year, but it was like a dry product, she'd be like, no, mm-hmm. you can't throw that away. You're like, we are going to eat that. I was like, it's past date. Like it's yeah. really past date. And now everything's changed about this thing, chemically speaking. And I don't want to eat this any longer because yeah. it's not safe. But according to her, it's totally fine. Did it, were right. your parents the same way? Well, my father in particular, because my father came from, uh, we're Jewish. And my father came from a little shtetl, a little town. Oh. And so we'd be at dinner and I have eaten half my lamb chop and I don't want any more. And he would say, oh, what I would have given to have a lamb chop when I was your <laughs> age. And you better believe I ate that lamb chop. Um, so that was, it came in that way, you know, yeah, um, absolutely. but, uh, who can blame him? You know, no, I know. Ram, you know he, it was his it. pride that he could serve his family lamb chops. If you think about the, where, you know, where they came from. So it was lamb chops and then it was rice a well, 
It's a delicious mm. dinner. <laughs> I do. I do wonder about what the next generation is going to be do do mm-hmm. diet wise because yeah. consumerism is taking over right now. Mm-hmm. You know, with Uber Eats, you can just order anything from anywhere yes. at any yes. time. You know, mm-hmm. everything is accessible now. So if, mm-hmm. if your kid's like, I don't want to eat the broccoli, you got to eat broccoli. You're going to eat the broccoli. Well, I've just ordered myself something else on Uber Eats. See you later. Right. I'm going to my right. You know, yes. my kid would never do that. Yes. But that is possible, <laughs> you know. It is um, possible. And the answer to that is it comes from the parents. We're the role yeah. models. Yes, and if we are also um, eating the cheeseburgers instead of the broccoli, our children learn. They watch us and they learn from that. There's some research out about the loss of the family dinner. So when yeah. I was growing up, we had dinner every night at six o'clock and my yeah. father was a traveling salesman. So he wasn't home, but at six o'clock that phone would ring and we'd be in the kitchen, my sister, my mother and I, and he would call and we'd all talk to him and then we'd have dinner. This went on for decades. This is how we raised that. That's gone. Now families don't have the six o'clock dinner and there's social psychology research. that's talking about the deficits and the damage that's doing to interpersonal relationships and people's relationships with food. So one mm. thing families can do is bring back that family dinner and have a healthy meal. Don't order in the pizza. Have the you know the lamb chops yeah. and the and the and the baked potato and the broccoli and have a nice meal and talk to each other. That can make a big change in how our next generation interacts with food. Firm believer in that. Firm believer that we we have a family meal every evening, and there we don't watch go. TV. We have no tablets, nothing like that right. at the table. That's it. Uh, we we play a thing called the alphabet game, and we will we'll go. We'll, we do that movie stars. We start with A and we work our way through B to C to Z. I love you know? it. And we go around, it take a turn each. Uh, and we do that all the time. I mean, it never gets boring. <laughs> it's no. not bored yet. We've been doing it for a year. Right. So if you, think about, if you think about people's like fond memories and love of like family gatherings, especially around the holidays, right? Like Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. Christmas. Yep. And people always think about those type of meals as being like the cornerstone mm-hmm. of a great experience, especially in that time of the year. Maybe what they really are craving is the family dynamic and the getting together mm-hmm. of it all, not so much the food itself. Because maybe let's just use the example of like, yeah. let's switch out the turkey for tacos. Right. Let's get together and have tacos yeah. as a family. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what they're really they're craving is the mm-hmm. family interaction unless <laughs> the <laughs> Yeah, the turkey it's about all. those shitty little paper hats you get in crackers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about for me. I don't care. It's, I love I, that. I wanna... um, I'll tell you that I never take vacation between Christmas and New Year because that's a very difficult time for my clinical patients oh, man, because yeah, family, me, family holidays like that can be very emotionally charged. That being said, we had a tradition uh, when my parents were still alive that we were always together for Thanksgiving. So my, my parents lived in New York. We, I would always come from California. That was our tradition. We never missed a Thanksgiving. And that was about family, uh, mm-hmm. less about the food and more about family. But it's also for many of us, the food we eat at these holidays are novelties. And so, again, if you take the mindful approach and say, yes, you can have the pumpkin pie and the apple pie, just eat it mindfully. Most people will just take the pie and do this because they feel like they're not supposed to have it or that this is their only chance to have it. So I think that the holidays are mixed between family and food issues and keeps me in business. (laughs) Um, I learned no, go you go first, on. Alex. You first. I've done a lot of talking tonight. You please. <laughs> I was just going to say about well, you know about my Christmas this, this just gone. I mean, we were technically mm-hmm. technically homeless throughout the the pandemic. Um, you know, we were still at my mother in law's, but it was a very cramped mm-hmm. apartment. It was issues mm-hmm. with this place anyway. Um, and we 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 came here four days before Christmas. Mm-hmm. We literally got the carpets done as we came in. Uh, we got the oven in. The guy a guy came out on yeah. Christmas Eve to fit our oven wow. because. Yeah. By law, you have to have someone to do it now. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we had the tree up and it was like we had no gifts, not many gifts or anything like mm-hmm. that. It was all about right. family. My mom yep. came down, my mother-in-law came down and it was all about that. It taught me a massive lesson mm-hmm. because like mm-hmm. those four days were so magical. It was like, yeah, it really was important. Sorry, Tom. The, pan- the, t- the pandemic did teach us that because we were yeah. isolated. Uh, in fact, mm-hmm. after our our um, conversation now, I'm heading down to San Diego, California, where I have a lot of family. I have not physically seen them since before the pandemic. And mm-hmm. even though this is about Labor Day and it's about Rosh Hashanah, this is about seeing my family and getting my hugs. Yes. Um, and so Very the pandemic so. did teach many of us to value our families because so many of us were separated from them for so long. So the idea that your family at Christmas time just valued the Christmas, forget about the presents. You're all together. You've got the Mm. tree. You're in your house. That's, that's one of the silver linings of this horrible pandemic. And I look for these silver linings, but this idea that families grew closer. Yes, I'll take it. 
Very much so. Um, no, all I was gonna say was I was gonna ask you what part of New York uh, your family's from. That's always my question. I never hear anyone's from New York. I'm like, oh, what part? So, so my parents were uh, arrived to Brooklyn. So I was yes. born in Brooklyn. I was raised on Long Island. And then my parents lived on Long Island uh, for their whole lives until they got older. And then we moved them to Westchester County, where my sister lives. And now um, my parents have both passed on, but my sister's in Westchester. And um, I'm in, I came to Los Angeles. I got recruited out of law school for a job. And I said, I'll stay for five years. I'm here 36 years now. I forgot to go home. That's because like, California is excellent. Oh, um, I'm, I'm I don't own a well. jacket anymore. Are you? Where are you from? Yeah, yeah. I, I was born in uh, Kingston, New York. Uh, Poughkeepsie, Love it. Uh, right? yeah. yeah, like yeah. an hour upstate and all that type of jazz. Yeah, which, nice. which I, everybody that we talk to, by the way, everyone's like, oh, they have the right answer. They're like, oh, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You know, the real New York. Then I'm like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, Poughkeepsie. And they're like, oh, that's <laughs> nice. I'm like, yeah. thanks. I appreciate your sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe when your family came off the boat, they started in Brooklyn and then they went. Yeah. My mother, well, my mother arrived at Ellis Island. That was, you know, she came well, straight my, there. My grandfather's from Brooklyn. Like, he's a real New Yorker. He's a real there New Yorker. He moved to Southern Jersey. He's a real city guy, you know, really, mm-hmm. really good dude and all that yeah. jazz. I'm the I'm <laughs> the one that's like, yeah, Vermont, Poughkeepsie. These are the places <laughs> that are recognizable to me. Um, <laughs> I Dr. Love Sheila, it. you have been just an amazing, amazing guest. It has been oh, such a so fun much. time talking with you. I appreciate um, being here with both of you. Can you please tell everyone where they can you know, follow you, where they can get your book, all that type of stuff. Of right now is the of time course. to do the, uh, the, the, the. Thank you. I appreciate that. The easiest way to reach me is through my website, which is called Tame Your Appetite, T-A-M-E, yourappetite.com. There, all the links to my social media are there. You can join my newsletter, my books and other products. or Everything's there. That's the home base for the mindful eating stuff. It's the best way to find me. So, so It's a beautiful website. Appetite. Beautiful website. I'm on there right now. And you get greeted thank with you. Dr. Sheila Foreman's beautiful smile as you come onto the website. So. Oh, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank um, you. Dr. Sheila, what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to, um, after we get through, because we have a we have a big charity event coming up at the end of September. Mm-hmm. So like my, that's where kind of like our minds are right the second. But I feel like this will be the next logical step on how to maintain the, the terrific progress that Alex and I have been making. So mm-hmm. What I'd like to do is I'd like to either get – I'm going to try to get your book or I'm just yeah. going like, to kind of become more knowledgeable about this. I'd like to talk to you again in like a year of or course. so and kind of, of see where we're at and maybe like um, go through this whole discussion. Not again, but like go through yeah. a different facet of discussion as people right now. Yeah, 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 exactly. When he's when he's <laughs> <laughs> when he looks like that for, for apparently because dieting makes you look like a fish. I don't know. Oh, I don't um, know why that is. What I, I I have three books out there right now. I'm actually going to be publishing books on mindful eating coming up in 2022. But oh, I would recommend the book "The Best Diet Begins in Your Mind" is the one I'd recommend for the two of you because that deals with the emotional eating. It's a it looks at eight emotions that we tend to eat over, and you open up the book if you're pissed off, you're angry. Go to the chapter on anger. What else can you do? If you're yeah. feeling lonely, what else can you do? That would be the one of the three. If you're going to pick up one, that'd be the one I'd recommend for where you are right now in your weight loss journey. Excellent. I would I would really like to continue this conversation because mm-hmm. I think that's My very pleasure. beneficial to everyone that's listening. So thank mm-hmm. you again for coming on. Of course. Um, thank you for the invitation. What we tend to do now is we we're gonna we're gonna slip on over to the little lounge. We're gonna geek out. I've been watching What If on Marvel and DC on Disney, <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna have a bit of a geek out about that. But what we'll do is we'll let you we'll let you get on with your day. Uh, but thank again, you. thank you so much for speaking to us, and thank you to of the guys at Guestbook for organising this. But uh, uh-huh. ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sheila Foreman, thank you so much. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in a year, if not sooner. Take care, yes, gentlemen. <laughs> have a great time. Bye-bye. Tally thank her. you. Bye bye. See you now. <laughs> I love that so much. That's gonna be my sign off from now on. It's like tally ho, tally ho. Oh, there we go. Can we? I can remove her. There we go. Um, should we just wait? Wait a couple of seconds. I've, yeah, she's gone. That's lovely. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, let's get over to the later lounge. Uh, Hey yo! Why is it? Let's try that again. Ready? We're gonna have to. Let's try it one more time. Tell me when you're ready. Yeah. Taxi. Wait. I really wish like the taxi would not proposition you like that in front of me. Like I get it, we have a different relationship and stuff, but like how does he know that our relationship's open? Why does he assume that? 
It's because I was flashing my dick at him in the, in the back seat. That's what you were doing. I thought you were looking for gum. God, I'm yeah, so idiotic. I, I, I flicked my underwear aside. I was like, look, look, <laughs> look, look <there. laughs> I gave him a little bit of log shot, Tom. I was showing him the outline. That's why I'm wearing sweatpants right now. <laughs> I went for a basic instinct. Uh, <laughs> oh, you dirty fuck. Sharon's stoning your way into a fucking cap. We still have to pay, though. So apparently your fucking flash didn't do the dance. Uh, yeah, I couldn't see for the cobwebs. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, Dr. Sheila Foreman, that was great. I love the, I love those conversations, though, because... Like we were saying at the beginning of that episode, it, it opens our minds and it gives us the tools we need to have these conversations. And it's right on the money with who we are as human beings as well. I know it's very like timely. We we always find like these interviews and these people to speak to when they're very timely into our real lives. It's like we almost planned it or something. Hmm. I know it's crazy. Yeah, but, but, but the guy but we did TV though. guest. <laughs> yeah, if you guess for it, man, it's all them. They, they just send us people that we need. They're like, they, they, I feel like they're looking into our lives like, oh, those fucking idiots really need this right now. Shoop. Mm. And then we yeah, get ja- me and Jackie uh, sort of follow each other on social media and stuff. And she's very active with the stuff on, on the biscuits. So you see how, how active I am. Um, but she's probably like, yeah, this guy definitely needs to speak to a counselor or some sort yeah, or some psychologist <laughs> a, a little bit of uh love and a little bit of uh some dietitians but you look amazing like i i really am um discouraged by the fact that you 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 recognize the fact that you're doing well but then you still bash on yourself for doing little things like having fish and chips it's not like you're eating like you used to brother no 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 and that's the thing though i know how to moderate now and i know when i'm being bad do you know what i mean so like um it's been it has been a it's it's very difficult time for me at the moment. And this is gonna sound really fucking nuts, right? But last week we had the the folk festival. This week we have the food festival. You can't go to a food festival and be on keto. Are you fucking insane? No. On the tenth, uh, we are gonna be going to Beefy Boys, um, which yeah. is like which voted the best burger in the world. Um, so we're gonna have to have a burger there. Then we got uh pod aid, which I, I was actually speaking about that, and I was because originally I was gonna like order some fucking great food uh whilst we're doing pod aid but then i was thinking wouldn't it make more sense to be on keto so i wouldn't need as much to get me through potentially um you could also like you know have like a spread of like meat and cheese and still stay on keto but have like snacks accessible yeah. to you while you do it I could order that a, way, a kebab you know yeah hey we need to order a kebab or do like a keto kebab get like a uh, peppers and and uh, no well, keto things. meat uh the kebab meat lamb meat is lamb lamb so lamb, so lamb with some uh, some lettuce, which isn't keto, but it's low in carbs, onions, and some mayo. That's kind of keto. Just have that. Bam. And then agree. I'll need a massive shit afterwards. I'll be like, oh my God, I need to go. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be terrible. It would be terrible. Uh, how so, you been, man? How have you been good, good? brother? Good, good, man. Fucking, I mean, like, um, sorry to anyone that listens to last week's episode. Uh, we were going through some personal stuff, at least on my end of it all. And Alex, um, very gratefully took the reins. So, you know, if you if you heard last weekend, you're kind of like, where the fuck's Tom? Just know that I was I was just doing some some stuff. So I've been good, man. You know, I'm you're trying not, to. You don't have to take I, a step away, man. Like, uh, fucking, you, yeah. you know, what I mean, like, we. I always say to people um, that are, are working with us, you guys are my friends, and I love you more on a personal level than a professional level. So go and go and spend a week to yourself and sort your shit out. It's fine. I appreciate you know? that. But I, like I grow, I treat this like I do my job. I take respect in who I am. I love what we do. Like everything about this is like my enjoyment. So when something kind of messes with that, I really get off kilter. Like it, it, it really quickly, like, and the other thing is like, I'm, I'm also a creature of like habits. So like Saturday, I know I go to sleep, I wake up, I do my recording and then I go about my day. Um, so when something kind of like gets thrown in the way of that, I really get thrown off of like my game. So when I'm getting asked to like, you know, not record and to change everything like a couple hours prior, like it went from me being like understanding to the situation to yelling really fast. I'm like, no, you don't seem to understand like how much work goes into us planning this. And the fact is right now you're asking too much. And it, it just became like a thing and it calmed down. Like, and gratefully you were very, very cool about the whole thing. You're like, no, man. And like, no, go take a walk. Dude. You're fine. Don't worry about it. Like, it's not the deal. I got this. I got it handled. And it, it's not even like a let you down thing anymore. Cause now we've, we've come to realize in three years we've been doing this, that family shit comes up, you know, at the drop of a hat. So neither of us tend to get aggravated with one another. If we can't fulfill a commitment that we made, we're, we're very understanding with one another. But 
That being said, I know that we beat each, beat ourselves up more than anything else that the other could dish out because of how much we come to expect of ourselves as professionals. Yeah. But like I said, I love you, man. And uh, I care more about you on a personal level. But that being said, this is going to be a verbal warning. Uh, next week will be a written warning. So just, oh, okay, uh, cool, 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 good, good. When's the whipping start? Because that's where I'm really, I see, I'm not even like, I don't even have any personal problems. I'm just waiting for you to be like, so Tom, now it's spanking. I'm like, oh, no. Um, I, who's the closest to you? I'm going to send Donnie around with a... Uh, <laughs> great, but he's a man's man. He's going to whip my ass fucking, he's, <laughs> um, in the bad way. I saw this video last night, and I know we're going to talk about what if, but like I saw something, speaking of kinks, that really threw me off. It was this lady, and if anyone's listening, you should definitely go check it out. Type in uh, man in diaper on subway. And oh, you'll no. see the... Yeah, yeah. So it's this lady and this dude, and this dude's in some Jordans and a diaper, a male diaper. And like, she's this, like, this bigger gal. And like, at one point, she's like, Oh, come sit on mommy's lap. And then she's sitting on the lap of the past fire, acting very childlike. And then she starts whipping out her, her, mama milkers and she starts feeding them right there in front of everyone and people rightfully are like what the fuck and she's like mind your business mind your business this is natural and i'm like uh i guess Dude, it's like it's, it's, it's some of a fucking Wayans movie. <laughs> Dude, it like it's like. it's so bonkers to me, but like that's their kink, man. And especially doing yeah. it in public, I'm like, you're ballsy. Like, and but you'll notice that he's wearing shoes, so he might be playing a kid, but he's definitely not a kid because he's rocking those shoes with them diapers. You can tell people not to shame a kink, but you can't tell me not to laugh. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> it's very funny. Yeah. So if you're if you're listening right now, go check out that video really quick, and you'll have a quick laugh because it was just so ridiculous. And as long as you're not hurting so... anybody, it's absolutely yeah. fine. No, no, exactly. That that's the thing, right? It's like it, more power to you. But it's like if you don't expect people to mock you out in public for that, then you are just you know you're crazy. Absolutely. If you want to dress up like Xena Warrior Princess, crack on. You know. If you want to shove alien phalluses up your butt then crack on um <laughs> yeah we are going to talk about what if um, but first of all i want to show, I'll tell you about what i've been doing today obviously i mentioned it today i went to uh, the food festival in in shrewsbury which is amazing uh, i need to get beth heath on the show because i'd love to have like a real sort of chilled out chat with her because she's just a, an absolute superhero this girl is. She works for Shropshire Festivals. There's a huge team of them, and they run Oktoberfest and Shropshire uh, uh, Shrewsbury Food for the Food Show food, food Show Food Festival. What the fuck yeah. has just happened? The Kids Festival. <laughs> she does so. She does so much, right? Um, and it was just so like. I mean, look at look at the crowds. Look Whoa. at this. Is that John Hammond? Is he getting dinosaurs? <laughs> Look at these. <laughs> <laughs> that That's... dude, he is so confident in the way he looks. My yeah, God. That guy, um, no, that was the guy from the Dirty Rocking Scoundrels. He's from a band. And he was like uh, trying to get people to come and dance with him. I was like, he's so fucking brave. Um, but yeah, there's, there's literally thousands of people there. There, was, there are better pictures that I could have used. I don't want to use them. But um, I like those. I like those a lot. Actually. But like, if I'd have seen that six months ago and I'd have walked straight into that, I probably would have been like, uh, <laughs> uh, this is a bit odd but like i'd had a bit i've had a bit of time to sort of wean myself into being around people again and it was actually just really nice just to see the world being open again and, and yes. things happening so that was really nice um but like this and we need to talk about this 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 thing with um uh agriculture and technology come together because mm. i think it's it, it would make for a great podcast i need to show you this shit guys because this looks very basic to me, but this is a tiny little robot making a pizza. It's very slow, but watch this video. Here you go. And camera, putting an olive down. He's very camera shy. I was trying to do it before. Here we go. He's got the olive. He's uh, putting it on the pizza. He's going to choose a space where there isn't one. Is that part of the program? Hey, <laughs> look at that. That's fantastic. Um, when it comes to you, uh, obviously, I would have done it better. I'm saying like, that robot going <laughs> has not got anything on that's me. A... Like it's it's good. It definitely put the proper pl uh, placement of that pe of that uh, of that olive. But I'm just saying, like me as a human being, I would have I would have blown that thing out of the water. That thing is just because it, even though it's really slow, it goes to the pallet. It picks up an olive. It recognizes an olive. Picks it up, brings it round, and then finds a space where there isn't one, 
and then drops it on the pizza, right? Was there other food on the plate? Like, it was there like olives <laughs> and cheese and all sorts of other shit? Or was it just olives on the plate? No, I think it was just scanning for the olive shape. You know, oh, okay. so if, if you'd have put right. like, I reckon if you'd have put grapes in there, it would have just picked up a grape. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Fuck but, you, robot. <laughs> you're not perfect. You make mistakes. It's like, so do you, Tom. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but like, uh, they got this uh, land drone. It's basically a remote control car, but automated, completely automated. You can like chuck it on a, on a crop field and then just leave it overnight. And it'll go up and down the crops. And it'll pick slugs off. It'll pick slugs off. Off your what? off your vegetables, um, it will then look for problems. So if there's a fox or something, it will alert the farmer, and then the farmer will come out. And then they they also have like proper drones, huge drones that do sheep herding, and they do oh, sheep I've herding. Seen that. I've seen that. I have seen that. Like that was a that was a video that my wife showed me a while ago. They were using drones to sheep herd. I was like, oh, that's very clever. But with positive reinforcement as well. I was like, I was thinking of something out of Airwolf, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Diagonal (laughs) choppers. Well, the percentage of lost sheep from the gunfire is like one to ten, but damn, (laughs) is it effective. (laughs) But no, it's like uh, what we do is we we let them eat from the drone and then we let it fly down and give it food. So when they see the drone, they follow it because they think they're going to get food. I'm like, wow. Very smart. That's yeah. very, very smart. Wow. And they're massive as well. I'll try and find a picture of the drone. But um, yeah, it was very, it's just a, a, an amazing conversation to have. Because when you think of farming, you think of farmer Giles, right? Standing there with his picture for a car. Oh, yeah. I've been making turnips all my life. Yeah. Just something yeah, here, yeah. turning over the dirt and I'm all that. Very American Gothic, like uh, pitchfork, the, the farm yeah. and then the background. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, but then you see those monster tractors that have got like six six feet wheel arches, and you're kind of like, oh, actually, there's quite a lot goes into this, isn't there? <laughs> I'd really like you to like. I know, I know, we always talk about getting together, and eventually we will. But like, when you come to visit um, my part of Vermont, especially, you're really gonna be like, wow, you live around a bunch of farms, huh? I'm like, oh yeah, dude. Like, I'm the uh, we like we had to get chickens just to be able to fit in the community. They're like, if you don't produce something, you gotta leave. And I'm like, fuck, I gotta get some chickens. <laughs> Um, so yeah, old like, guys stand at the bottom yard with a bow now, like, yeah, it's, a, it's actually a blunderbust. He's got it from his great great grandfather, who was a privateer. Um, and he takes pot shots at me. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, really quickly, like, I, I would actually love to speak to any of the people that you brought on, especially those things. I think the farming would be such an interesting conversation. So, if you can get one of those guys, please do. Um, oh, even that robot yeah, university, I'll, I'll definitely get in touch with them. Because I could pay, I mean, like, I'm gonna praise this robot up and down because it's very, very cool. I love the fact that technology is making the leaps and bounds it is, but I'm also gonna poke fun out of it a little bit. I'm like, you know, what else can that <laughs> yeah. robot do? I said to, I said to, um, as I was talking about this robot, I, I, I was doing the podcast and I was like, uh, so I just watched the video, watching this robot put olives on a pizza. Uh, but don't worry, guys, the if you work on a the pizza counter at Walmart, your job's safe, it takes a while. And you should have seen the pain of hurt, the, the, the look of hurt on this guy's face. He's like, oh, <laughs> that was that's my See, baby, man. I, fucking... I, I trained that robot to recognize the banana in, in plums, and I'd be like, okay, so this is what you got to do to peel a banana. You got to go up and down the banana really slowly, and then before you know it, I'm make a jerk off robot, and that's what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> you bastardized my child, you piece of shit. Um, quickly to get off that topic, uh, did you see the fucking Spider Man? Um, far from not far from home. Um, what, no, what's no, the new no way movie? home. No way home. Have you seen the fucking trailer for that movie? Yes. Yes, I have. Oh very good. God. It's very, very Whoa. good. Very, yeah. very good. That's very undersold. I think that fucking trailer looks amazing. Um, but I think they've I think they've been a bit of a tomfoolery going on there. I don't think that's Doctor Strange. I don't think that's our Doctor Strange at all. Because there's no way he would go because they try they're into introducing us now to different variations of different characters, right? Yes. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what if, but we saw a very different version of Doctor Strange in the same timeline as the Doctor Strange of ours. Um yes. but you know uh and um yeah I, I it's not like Doctor Strange to go Okay, let's completely change the fabric of time just because you don't want to be known as Spider Man. He wouldn't do that. I don't think he would. Yeah, I don't think he would either. I, it's very interesting. Or maybe he's so like self sure that he's like, oh, I can do this without making a mistake because he is the Sorcerer Supreme. And it seems like something goes awry. I don't know. I, I don't want to make guesses about this because I don't, I want to be surprised. Like when they initially announced that they weren't going to drop the trailer at all, 
I dug that so much. I was like, cool, man. I would love to go in a movie not having any expectations and not knowing what is going on. That sounds great. And then they dropped the trailer. So now I have like little bits of information. Of course, we saw Dr. Octopus. Spoiler, spoilers. If you have not seen the trailer, I'm very sorry. Uh, we saw Dr. Octopus from uh, Spider-Man 2. Yep. We saw the pumpkin bomb from uh, Norman um, Nor- Osborne. uh, Norman's, uh, Norman Osborne's fucking Green Goblin number one from Spider-Man number one. Um, there's just a lot of little Easter eggs hidden throughout. James Franco's voice as well. There's um, William Defoe's laugh, but was that was that James Franco's? Be careful what you wish for, Spider Man. I think so. I think so. Yeah. If if it wasn't him, like it was, um, it sounded a little bit like what's his face. Um, um, it, it was either Norman or fucking Harry. It was one of the two. It was one of the two goblins. I was yeah, kind of yeah. hoping that they'd introduce like the uh, the hobgoblin finally. Like that's the thing I'm really waiting for. Everyone's mm-hmm. really excited for Carnage, which is a great thing for Venom. But as far as like the Rose Gallery of Spider Man, I've been waiting for Hobgoblin. He's one of my favorite goblins. I don't know who Hob- Hobgoblin is. I can't remember. He's uh, so he's a he's a thief that found Norman Osborn's technology. And um, instead of to becoming another like green goblin, because there's a few variations of the green goblin. Um, actually, here really quickly, I'll, I don't I don't want to misspell it. I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. You really quickly, you uh, you bam. Yeah, yeah, um, and you know, but the thing is, we, we've seen this before with Spider-Man Three, where they kind of introduced too many villains into one film, right? Because mm. we had Green Goblin again, and we had Sandman, and we had Venom, that version of Venom. We had a couple of different things, you know, and and it was it gets it gets like when there's too many villains in one film, it gets it gets difficult. But then we saw with like Spider Verse, like it can also be fun as well because I think Spider Verse did it right, and I feel like I saw an interesting uh, meme the other day, and it's saying um, video games are starting to humiliate movies with how they deal with their characters, and I was like, that's fucking mm. spot on. That is are those okay. Spider Man games for PS Five, PlayStation were just phenomenal. Uh, so, okay, the first Hobgoblin was Roderick Kingsley. He is an egotistical socialite and billionaire fashion designer. He decided to create a name a, a name criminal for himself, altering Norman Osborn's Goblin formula to improve the Goblin costume slash equipment in order to be the original Hobgoblin. Kingsley then frames Ned Leeds as a decoy for his crimes and later murders his successor, Jason um, McIndale, when his villainous identity is finally exposed by Spider-Man and Betty Brant. I don't know who the fuck that is. He flies to the Caribbean to hide from both of them when the law comes and his enemies come after. Um, after his twin brother is murdered by Phil Ulrich, Roderick returns to New York to dons his old hobgoblin costume. So there's a, been a few hobgoblins, and it was originally created by um, John Romita Jr. Um, he, you probably recognize him best. Like you watched the uh, um, you watched the Spider-Man cartoon from the '90s, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that, I love. He, he was a he was a he was a figure in that. He was the one with the yellow cape and the green face. He's he's really really cool looking. He threw like the actual pumpkin bombs, like Norman Osborn through the uh like the the technology the 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 you know like metal looking ones he threw the pumpkin bombs like they look like real pumpkins uh, shit it was a much more uh um much more fucking uh theatrical do you think this is a one-off the the, the you know bring in andrew garfield and toby Maguire? do you think it's one-off or do you think it, they'll they'll continue with it I bet you they're testing the waters. Um, I bet you that if it does hideously well, we'll get a multiverse one that is kind of like uh, Into the Spider Verse, where we have like uh, older Peter Parker, which would of course be Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, Peter Parker. Like, I I would be, I don't know. I didn't really dig there. Like, I've always very famously stated that I think that Tobey Maguire was a fantastic Peter Parker, but a horrible Spider-Man. Andrew Garfield was an excellent Spider-Man, but a horrible Peter Parker. Um, and I find that Tom Holland it was too cool. He was like, he oh, that guy's so cool. <laughs> You're like, I'd fuck him. And if I'd fuck Sp- Peter Parker, he's not Peter Parker. <laughs> Tom Holland, first of all, he's a young boy. I would never fuck that boy, Alex. And nor um, would I get in his way because he seems like a real badass. He is the epitome of what Spider-Man should be. So I'd be kind of disappointed if I saw more of the old two in the spider do you know i think we need though i I think we need to see the the modern age uh, tom holland uh 
Spider-Man kicking ass. He yes. seems to stumble across everything, man. I mean, the, the only time I really saw him kick ass was when he was like the 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 night monkey. You know, that yeah. was when he was. He was <laughs> but I want to see him absolutely just fucking annihilate someone because he always just like he's always falling over with Vulture. He was like panicking throughout the whole thing. Oh my god, I'm gonna steal the plane! Like I'm just like let him fucking annihilate someone. I'm set, like string him up, send him to jail. Like that's what I like seeing from Spider Man. Well, you, you know what I mean? Think, like th- this is very early in his career as we stand. Like yeah, he fought the likes of like Captain America, and he was on like the Civil War battle. But those are people that are not necessarily trying to kill him. They're just trying to stop him or stop him from stopping them. So that like first really big fight, because up until that point. Like, if you remember Robert Downey Jr. from um, the introduction of Civil War, he's like, oh, some person dressed as, like, a spider has been capturing purse thieves and blah, blah. So he has not had an epic battle up until Civil War. And then after Civil War, as I just said, that, you know, there wasn't a fight to the death. The Vulture was his, like, first fight to the death. So, of course, he's going to be a little bumbling. He has, he's never done this before. He's like a virgin. Yeah, but even then, he fucking nailed fucking Bucky and, and Falcon whilst taking the piss sure. like it was it was just like oh my god is this called carbon fiber like you got a metal arm like what the fuck man i, I want to see <laughs> so i'm really excited though that that trailer was bad ass and um yes it's it, and we got only got till christmas to wait i mean it's not that, it's not that far away really really not far away <laughs> Um, and it feels and it feels like spider-man's not so far away <laughs> and there's so much to look forward to as well especially if you like your star wars and obviously mcu is dri- dri- dripping the what if stuff uh, which is good i mean we've got like six minutes to go on about it so <clears throat> maybe we can do that at the live show on wednesday we can talk okay. about what if um, are you caught up with uh, rick and morty at all i think i've got one more episode to watch i think there's only i think i've done episode nine Okay, Boy, so the, the, the last episode is this the last? Do you know if it's the last episode of the season or is this the break in between? Um, uh, it's episode 10, isn't it? There's usually only like 10 in a season. If they go for another 10, I'll be well happy. Okay, so no, we're, they let it all go at the same time. Damn, because like I feel like the season just went way too fast. Like it just everything was what I what I found out about. I mean, I haven't seen the last episode, so I can't really say, but it was amazing. It was a lot of noise, a lot of noise, a lot of noise, crazy fucking shit. And it's like they, they completely changed or confirmed part of like the, the, the plot that we've all been mm. guessing at with a throwaway comment. Oh my yeah. God, you're living with a fucking, uh, you, you, you're living with a, a different version of our dead daughter. That's fucking weird. And I was just like, dude, like that threw me Did he just fuck fucking, off. did he just yeah. consider it? Dude, I caught that. I caught that the last day. I was like, oh my God, Beth's been fucking like the, oh my God, dead? that's amazing. Like it was just so fucking nuts and like the bird person of it all it's just amazing i, w- I watched that episode and we'll talk more about it because it's fucking phenomenal uh really quickly before we get into it um i think i've picked up a new hobby by the way uh pegging yeah to be pegging pegged. yeah yeah, yeah pegging i I'm, i've been really looking into pegging and i see like the 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 financial and the emotional benefits of doing it so i think that's the new thing i'm just gonna start getting fucked in my ass no so um, up today no just go in dry darling just go in dry. the the benefits of living in the middle of nowhere is i have virtually no light pollution I, i'm very well fitted for what um what they call astrophotography and that's where you get a really nice uh telescope uh newtonian telescope and you you know point at a certain direction you follow the sky and you can get like amazing pictures i was looking at these amateur pictures of like saturn you can see the rings and stuff and of course not segregated rings but i mean like one single ring but you could still see fucking saturn dude and like i don't know if it's just like how interested i am space maybe it really explains why all the movies i've been watching recently tend to be sci-fi like i'm very much into the uh into the the galaxy and the and our world and stuff but i think that's the next thing i'm gonna do like it for my free time so i'm gonna make surprised. a podcast about it no um, not at all not five at degrees all. up two degrees left nothing <laughs> nothing <laughs> you motherfucker you just stole you stole from principal skinner you piece of shit <laughs> Oh, is that a thing? I, I literally just. Oh, are you serious? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was remember the episode where Bart Bart's comet when he. Uh, when yeah, he I remember that balloon, episode, but I completely uh, forgot. Buttzilla, <laughs> the Skinner's fucking thing, and they were like, he's going. He's like twenty five degrees to the north, thirteen degrees west, nothing. And then fucking <laughs> Bart ends up finding <laughs> the fucking. Com- I thought you were totally comet. That was, that was wow. a complete coincidence, but yeah. Well, wow. Cool. Mm-hmm. All right. Fucking yeah. So don't be surprised if you start seeing lots of weird pictures of Tom of Uranus. <laughs> smudge on the lens 
Smudge <laughs> on the lens. <laughs> By the way, I found out while in you know looking this up, I'm like, oh, cool. What's the setup cost, dude? Telescopes are expensive. Mm. So Tom is going to be uh, selling himself on the streets of Vermont. So if you see him on the corner, actually, I'm selling my a couple of my comics. I have uh, Carnage's first appearance in Spider-Man in perfect condition. So I'm waiting until that drops, and I'm going to sell all three of them, the three part issues. And I figured that could pay for my telescope. Give up shells, being, I'm uh, well interested to see how much they go for, mate. I really am. Um, right now you can get all three for like you know, like 350 or something like that. It's it's not crazy money, but funnily enough, that's exactly the amount of money I need for a telescope. So it's 350. Apply, yeah, yeah, 350 bucks. But that's just the telescope. There's also like a motorized component that you need that which tracks the stars, and there's a better lens you need if you want to. So you can go to check see. on Saturn every night. All right, buddy. Yeah, how's it going? Like, kind of dude, like it really like. I don't know what it is about a dude. I like, and the thing is, like, you remember like the old photos that they show us in school planets? You're like, oh, it's kind of blurry. Like, maybe it's something like that because it kind of looks like that a little bit. And I, I, I don't know what it is about that, but I'm very intrigued about doing that. And I'd like to kind of have something to do with the kids. I think they might be a little bit into it. It's, mm. it's something. And I, I like art. You know me. I'm an artsy type of guy. Maybe this is my new thing. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going through a midlife crisis, Alex. And I don't have money. To <laughs> Get off my dick. All I'll say on the matter to close it is if you live near Tom and you listen to the show, uh, heed my advice. Close the curtains when you come up the show. <laughs> <laughs> or don't. You know, whatever. Tom's got a very gonna get, get a very strong telescope. He's gonna he's gonna see that shit. And he's I'm gonna be able like, to count the freckles on your ass. Like you ever seen two Canadians fuck across the border, Alex? I have. <laughs> Amazing. Right, let's tell our listeners about stuff that's going <laughs> Oh, let's tell our listeners about shit that's going on. Right, okay. So we've got a number of shows to tell you about. So obviously there's this show, What's the Difference? Where we speak yeah. to amazing guests like we did to Dr. Shilia. She she oh god. La, 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 la. Dr. Shilia today. Uh, and we uh, last week um it was uh John Levine. Hey, yeah. <laughs> and the week before that, um uh, uh, there was Mo Judy Lamour. He was an amazing guest, by the way. He was Such fantastic. A fun guest. Um, so make sure you watch uh, what's the difference every week. Um, and then also as well, if you're watching on YouTube, will you please subscribe? Or I was going to come around your house and shout abuse at you. Uh, <laughs> I have a telescope. I can tell you I'm what you're doing. Yeah, Tom yeah. can watch me whilst I beat you to death. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, no, guys. no, no. You would never do. He's so British. You would never do that. I, I apologize profusely. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Wednesday Night Live is a show we do every Wednesday, of course, and it's at 9 p.m. UK time, which is 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, and it's basically where we get together and we, we banter. See, it evolves all the time. And at the moment, Tom has got this new great format where we all bring subjects that we can take down a rabbit hole or we can just talk about. Yes, it's, it's fun. Than... It's it's a cool way to kill stuff. Like it, the show is always evolving, right? Like it started off as one thing as oh, Wednesday Night Live, and it's it's always going to be evolving. And it's it's something that we do to keep ourselves interested. And right this second, like because me and David had such an enjoyable time with a couple episodes back where we went down the rabbit hole of pogs, I figured that'd be Fuck fun about me, all... bastard. <laughs> Well, I thought about that. I was like, Alex, Alex went to a wedding. He doesn't need to talk about pogs. He has, he has love in his heart. He doesn't need a slammer Bust. of love. Yeah. A slammer of love. Um, <laughs> but I figured like, you know, this would be kind of like a fun thing to go through a little bit and it can be conspiracy theories. It can be um, whatever you want. Something nostalgic. Like last week um, on the last week, we talked about Mighty Max. Uh, oh, that was yeah. good. That was actually yeah. really good. Yeah, that was really fun. Um, so, like, if you guys have any recommendations for anything you want to hear us kind of deep dive on the show about, please send them in. Um, we don't really care. We're looking at anything. We're not in. You know, I was going to bring up Boglins. You. What's that? Boglins. What's that? Did you have Boglins? No, no. Save it for Wednesday. Mm -hmm. If I, I don't know what the rubber toys. Is. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, cool. I like this. All right. I'm fucking. Yeah. And then we'll go through it. We'll kind of dissect everything about it. We'll find more about it. And you might learn something. Like when we did the Pogs episode, I now can tell people what Pogs stands for. So it stands for pomegranate orange guava, which is the juice that the carton was that the Pogs came from, based on a old game from Japan um, that was used with cardboard cards. And then it evolved into, you know, po uh, Polynesia over in Hawaii. So we they can thank Hawaii for Pogs. There you go. A little something. Yeah, and ice cones. I yeah, yeah. Shave, shave <laughs> ice, shave ice. Yeah. Um, um, so that's Wednesday. <laughs> what the fuck am I talking about? Uh, that's know. Wednesday on live, it. and we we also have um, 
Yelling at Clouds, which is a show that I do with the amazingly intelligent uh, Eric Fluger. Um, we talk about uh, art, um, and Eric likes to take people to class, likes to teach you guys about art. And one of the episodes we did was about the movie The Founder with Michael Keaton, which is an amazing movie. But Eric, Eric is all about art and about graphic design and about what, how it moves people. And the, obviously the movie, The Founder, is about the, the McDonald's story, which that golden M is one of the most kinetic pieces of art, graphic design, whatever you want to call it, in the world. You see the M and you think about Big Macs and stuff. So that was a really good episode that we talked about. And also I do want to tell people about my radio show, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is Naughty Talk. Um, on splashdamageradio.co.uk um it's a it's a show i do every thursday at 7 p.m uk time and um, it's for three hours naughty's music uh, and i have a great a lot of fun of it you can join us on discord during the show you can chat to us you can uh, request music it's a, a lot of fun so we're doing so much man um i, I think this show is actually going to go after pod aid so is it no, so, I mean, we've got to tell people about it just in case, but uh, do you want to have to go to town and tell people what a pod aid is? Do you reckon you'll be able to get through it? Yeah, I can do a pod aid. Um, I actually did it last week. Let me uh, let me get over here really quick. Yeah, I got this. I got this. Hey, guys. So we have a charity event coming up, and it's a very, very cool little thing. Uh, we've been looking for uh, supporters for a while for it, you know, some sponsorship. It's, it doesn't seem like it's working out as well as we want, but that doesn't mean you can't help. September 29th, we are going live, and we're going live for 24 hours, and we're going to be recording. We're have phenomenal guests like with the likes of Eddie Pence, Mark Summers, um, Adam Purnell. Like there are so many guests and so many cool opportunities to speak to people. And we're gonna be doing it all for this amazing charity organization called Lingen Davis, which is in Shropshire. And here's our thing, potted 24 hour podcast challenge. And it's an aid of Lingen Davis. And we also are partnered with Reach Media. Um, and they are, you know, very gratefully kind of like back in this whole thing. It's it's been a lot of fun and a very um uh uh, it's, it's a big teaching moment because we're learning all sorts of things and it's not just a one-time event like we we're going to be doing this but our challenge to you is no matter what ends up happening with this we want you to next year use whatever kind of media you have your art whatever it is and we, we challenge you to do the same thing maybe not for our um, same charity, but a different charity. Oh, definitely uh, we, for pot age. Make sure you make uh, sure yeah. you do it for pot age, bitches. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, well, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, like, um, <laughs> we, we want you to beat us, is what I'm saying. We want you to do yeah. better than us. Um, and also in that in that same mindset, we will be releasing the uh the donate button um in this next week, if I'm not mistaken. And yes. that is gonna be your access to be able to give. And guys, you know what? We we don't expect you to give a million dollars, but every little bit counts, and it's for charity. So I mean, like, you can feel good about knowing that your money's going to a good place, not going. <laughs> To that bag of Cheetos, you could give like three bucks, man. Any any little bit helps, and it's it's going <laughs> towards a great thing. And I hope you know that if you like what I just said, oh, actually, since you just made me do that, I'm gonna do this. Um, hey Alex, do we have a website? Hello? A website, did you say? Oh my god, yes, we do. We have a website. Uh, you can catch ours, us at yousucknetwork.com. That's our website, and you can see all of our content on there. There is a play button, you can listen to our content, you can find out all about us. Um, and that is made for our good friends at Web Orchard. Um, see, and, and Pete White, who I saw today at the food festival, I saw him, he, he wow. was, um, well, in Shrewsbury, we have this tradition of we have a, a coliseum, and he was fighting tigers. He was fighting tigers <laughs> with his bare hands, and he was like, honestly, it was like I've heard that the play button was broken uh, for the USUC website, so I must defeat these tigers so I can go and code properly and fix the website. That's how dedicated Pete White is at uh, making sure that our website runs. I mean, if you want a beautiful website that looks just as good as us, go to the Lady Lounge and look at the strippers greased up and down that pole, <laughs> right? That will give you the inspiration to then get out of there as quick as possible, jump on your phone, and then go to uh, Web Orchard's website uh, and then <laughs> get a, an account with them because they make great websites. Um, and uh, no, seriously, we work really well with Web Orchard. I was speaking to Pete today. He was like, we love you guys. So uh, it's we're not, we're not going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. Web Orchard, they're the best, baby. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. And that was nowhere right. near as good as how Bruno does it, by no the way. No way. I love that so much. That was so brilliant. I was like, he's fighting tigers, eh? For the benefit of us trying to have continue oh, to have a website. Dude, bear, <laughs> wow. He used bare hands. Where'd he get the bare hands? <laughs> I don't know, but he's now got a nice tiger, tiger skin rug for his. <laughs> Ooh, he's he's going to be an animal before you know it. 
Um, mm. Guys, we fucking love you so much. This has been What's the Difference Podcast. I am Tom Bruno. And I'm Alex Whiteley. Let's get the fuck out of here. Hi, this is a kiss from our real monsters. And um, I would like very much to ask you, if you don't mind, to watch um, the USAC Network with Tom Bruno and Alex Whiteley. Oh, that's all. I have to go flush myself now.